The date is Friday, April 23rd, and you're listening to Entertain This, a thought-provoking podcast encapsulating all things entertainment. This week, we're joined by a special guest and comedian, Scott Curtis, host of the Behind the Bits podcast, to discuss a very peculiar film, Blue Velvet, directed by David Lynch. We'll discuss what makes it so weird and some of the potential meanings behind the oddities as we take a deeper look into the dark film noir tale. So enjoy! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode of your favorite internet podcast. That's right, ladies and gents, it's Entertain This! Entertain This! As always, I am your intrepid host, I'm Alex. I'm Michael. And I am Nick. Welcome back, guys. Hi. Um, so I don't want to be too crazy with the intro this time, but I do have something that I want to talk about. But before all of that, this is our uh, last episode of our four-week usual rotation. There is a fifth week, and we have something special planned for the uh, the fifth Friday of the month, as as we always try to do. Uh, but this is our guest episode. It's the fourth Friday of the month, and we have a very special guest in the studio with us. Mm -hmm. So we will be getting to him. But first, boys, I have breaking news. Um, breaking. We've been following, yeah, we've been following the story of Lil Nas X. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And uh, something new has broke. The story only gets deeper from here. Uh, to catch those of you up who don't already know about all of the Lil Nas X uh, situations that are going on. He released a song called Montero. Um, and with it, he also released a pair of limited edition sneakers. 666 of them were made and they were called Satan shoes. They were released through a brand called mischief. Uh, and they were sold for about a thousand bucks, but being that there were only 666, they were obviously going to resell for more. We're talking about this because it's entertainment based. It mm -hmm. matched up with the release of his new song. It was a great marketing ploy. Problem was, they used Nike Air Maxes from, I think they were uh, 99, 1999 Nike Air Max as their base for the Satan shoes. And they advertised it as Nike Satan shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mischief had had a tie up with Nike already called uh, Jesus shoes, which the soles were full of holy water. In this case, the soles were full of uh, replicated human blood with the mm -hmm. promise that there was one drop of human blood in every Satan shoe. Um <laughs> Crowds didn't like this. People didn't like that the Satan shoe existed. So they started to boycott Nike and they talked down to Nike and said, hey, Nike, this isn't cool. So Nike, um, trying to protect their brand name, sued Little Nas X and Mischief. And basically were like, you're not allowed to send out the shoes. So last time I, I picked up on that and I told you I did find some of the shoes for sale on the secondhand market, meaning some people who weren't supposed to get the shoes got the shoes. Um, and we were like, well, there's not much they can do about that. If they claim that they sent them out before the lawsuit told them they weren't allowed to, then the shoes are out there in the world and that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. um, well, that wasn't the end of the story. So okay. the breaking news to add to this, uh, this, this saga that we are facing, the Lil Nas X uh, Satan shoe saga, uh, his song Montero uh, was taken off of all streaming services as of yesterday. You can no longer stream his song that released with the shoe. You can't stream it on YouTube. You can't stream it on Spotify. You can't stream it anywhere in almost any country. You are not able to stream it right now. Um, why that is, I have no idea. I only found out because I follow him on Twitter because of this saga specifically. <laughs> um, and he was right. complaining about it on Twitter. And people were like, ah, he's just messing with us. Because he was like, go stream the song now while you can. Because they're about to take it down everywhere. And everybody was like, oh, he's just trying to get more streams because he became the number one stream song in the world because mm -hmm. of everything that happened, which shows guerrilla marketing does work. Mm -hmm. um, it do, it do. But a little bit after that, the song was taken down and you can't stream it anywhere now. So he is no longer making money off of Montero and you can't listen to it. Hmm. OK, so but I just double checked and on my Spotify, I can bring it up and I can play it. So you can play it as of right now. As, As of, of yesterday, right you were not able to play it. Okay. So maybe yesterday maybe something changed where I since then. Didn't actually use Spotify. It's breaking. <laughs> it's breaking news. Maybe they figured it out, but it was taken off of all streaming services as of yesterday. So, is it even a good Where will song? the saga go next? <laughs> oh, it's it's a, a bop. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a really great like, song. 
it's been my go-to like dead brain song so it's like whenever my brain just doesn't feel like working that's just what comes up interesting so that is uh that is the saga continuing and maybe next week we'll have more information on it but for now that's all i got <laughs> maybe um, you'll actually listen to the song who knows <laughs> it's it's been pretty nuts if you can we'll have to find out and see um there's one more thing that I want to go over before we get on to the actual physical episode that we're recording right now. Mm-hmm. And that is ding, 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 ding. Entertain This has been nominated for an award. What? Whoa. Y'all hear about this? I did. Actually, Entertain you told this. me. <laughs> yeah. Entertain This, who recently joined the Scene Snobs Network. Um, we have been recognized through a, a, an indie podcast award show called The Snobbies, which was run by the network that we signed to, though not exclusive to them. Um, and we have been nominated for four categories. We don't know at, at this minute uh, when we're recording what those categories are, but they are to be announced physically tonight. Not like Friday night when you're listening to this, but the night that we record it, they're going to do it tonight. So by tonight, we should know what we're actually nominated for under the categories, but they sent us this to show. So I'm going to show it uh, in the same way we showed monster hunter last week. So those of you who are enjoying the, the strict audio version of the podcast, I, I'm sorry. Uh, you should come and check out our show can, on Friday night. I can describe it for and those who are audio. Here it is. Anyway, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba, yep, ba, it's woo. a logo of like a microphone and it has snobby award nominee written on it in nice serif font yeah, yeah. yeah nick you have to write that up in the show notes so that way people who can't listen link the in the show notes <laughs> you you were so loud that you made michael's dogs bark just now <laughs> that was incredible <laughs> my goodness so we're gonna move forward with our show we're gonna bring you what you're here to consume which is another uh, exciting episode and in, in an attempt to encapsulate all things entertainment. I think of our show as kind of like a time capsule of entertainment, something that mm-hmm. someday people will go back and listen to and um, figure some stuff out about what it was like to be entertained by what was going on in our lives at the time. Um, so before we jump into that, I want to introduce our guest this week. Um, is a super awesome, super cool guy. Uh, had us on his show recently, mm-hmm. the Behind the Bits live show mm-hmm. um, that he does every Thursday. He welcomed us on. He is a comedian, and his name is Scott Curtis. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, hey, welcome, Scott. hey, hey. Uh, where do I get those quality. Satan? Where do I the get Satan those shoes? <laughs> those Satan shoes. Uh, if you want them, you gotta find them on a secondary selling website, so like Mercari okay. or eBay. But okay, they are, I, if I, I can look up the price right now, but the last time I checked, twenty thousand dollars was oh, that's easy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great. You have that you have that live show money. That's the thing. Oh, See, yeah. we're pre-recorded, so we're like on a whole different <laughs> yeah. tax bracket than you. Yep, yep. But but you have that live money, that, that live show money. Everything you said totally has not been on my radar at all i have i don't know who little nas or little naz or whatever his name is i don't know the song um i've i've got some nike running shoes that's that's all that's all i got well you have you have a pretty a pretty good connection there um yeah it's crazy what they're doing right now um and it kind of goes into this weird concept of, yeah, I mean, this was your shoe, but we bought it from you and then we turned it into something else. So is yeah. it still your shoe? Um, but that's kind of the fight, the fight that's being fought right now, which that's why we're following it. I mean, if you want to encapsulate all things entertainment, this is entertainment still. Yeah. This is the music industry and what's going on in it. So I, I was entertained by your synopsis. I, I'm, I'm going to look stuff up just because of it. Yeah, you should for sure. And maybe even go buy yourself a pair of Satan shoes. Oh, yeah. um, but that's not important right now. We want to we don't want to talk about Satan or his shoes. We want to talk about you, <laughs> Scott. Tell us tell us more about you. Maybe tell us about your shoes. Are you Satan? First off, uh, uh, good very, very close. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we 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 go to the same gym. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was Jim. So I I am uh, what I call myself a uh the latest bloomer in the world i started doing stand-up comedy when i was 52 and i'm gonna turn 57 here in june so i've been doing it for just under five years 
And in the process of doing stand-up comedy as a hobby, I found out uh, I really liked it first off. And second off, I was kind of good at it. And I don't say that because I think I'm good at it. I say it because people told me I was good at it. So I got a little bit more serious about it right before the pandemic and started traveling a little bit. And then the pandemic hit and I was uh, obviously kneecapped from performing. But... Uh, in the process, I was getting a podcast together that I wanted to be a very pure podcast about stand-up comedy because, as as you know, in entertainment, it, it's all an art, and stand-up oh, yeah. comedy is an art, and I think it's really the raw, rawest far, form of art because it's basically a person and a microphone. That's all you really get. Sometimes you don't even get the microphone. I've done that before, too. So... It, what I wanted to do is get all the knowledge I could from working stand-up co comedians. And I wanted to make sure that I was talking to comedians that were, um, first of all, the, the old favorites, the people who've been around for years and years, people who are currently working, different levels of stardom. Uh, I want to mm -hmm. talk to people who are basically making all or most of their living uh, doing stand-up comedy. And basically I just ask for advice. I just say, you know, how do you write? How do you perform? You know, what works for you? And if, if you've listened to the podcast, you know, I kind of let it go where the guest takes me because each guest has their own passion. They have their own take on things. And if I get them in what they are interested in, then I don't have to talk very much. So um, yeah. that's that's basically what the podcast is about. It's I call it kind of a serious talk about stand-up comedy, and it's more of a purist comedy thing. There's not a lot of laughing going on. It's, it's mostly really serious talk because this is their way of making a living. So I get as much information as I can. It's amazing how different comics see comedy different. It's amazing the things that are similar between two comics that you would never think are anywhere close to the same. I've learned so much, and I've obviously made some really, really good friends and connections from it, too. Yeah. I, I love your concept of let the show go where the show's going to go, according to the guest. Yeah. I think that's an award winning uh, algorithm for for shows like what you're doing and what we're doing. Um, our algorithm's very similar. I think walking into this when we well, not when we asked you to be a guest, but when you offered us uh, your your yeah. your expertise <laughs> yeah. on, on your show. And if you guys haven't seen that yet, I uh, implore you to go to our YouTube channel and, and check so out our fun. our episode mm -hmm. on. Uh, the uh, BTB live show. It was a whole lot of fun. You can go watch it on our YouTube channel, but um, where you offered to come on our show and talk to us about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but when we, we asked you on our show, uh, one of the things I told you was like, we're handing you the reins. Like you're leading us down this trail. We're yeah. just following behind. So that, that is kind of our, uh, our go-to with guests as well. It's just to kind of let them uh, go ahead and, and do their thing and control our show for, for right. that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I do want to mention the BTB Internet talk show that you guys were guests on. So take everything the Behind the Bits podcast is about and throw it out the window and you get the BTB Internet talk show. I, I like to call it um, like the worst uh, talk show on earth. Uh, but basically, <laughs> basically what I wanted You're to so do. You're so humble. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to be, I wanted an outlet to be silly, but I don't really like doing Zoom comedy. So I wanted to yeah. make up something that was still fun. Um, I could have people on I knew, I could have people on I don't know. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be a podcaster. You don't even have to be a comic. If you want to come on the show, just come on the show. And, and sometimes it really works. And Dean Martin has fun. And yeah. uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. But when you guys were on, it was like all the stars aligned and I had the best time ever. And I'm like, let's just do the show with these guys from now on. And obviously that can't happen. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, man, maybe this will mean I have two good ones in a row. And that did not happen. So, you know, it was you guys, not a very good one, an OK one, a really bad one and then a really good one. So that's pr pretty much the way it's gone. Back on the up well, and up now, yeah. <laughs> we're we're excited to have you on our show and that same chemistry be kicked up. Um, yeah, we're talking about something that uh, 
so often on this show, we look for things that maybe we didn't know anything about going into Mm -hmm. um, to kind of wade the waters of entertainment. And on your show, you introduced us to a thing that none of us were familiar with. And now we have all been tortured into watching. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And torture it was, though, uh, informative and interesting. Um, And if you want to go ahead and introduce that, uh, be my guest. Yeah, how, uh, how's your, your before before I introduce it, how's your dreams been since then? I didn't dream eventful. Last night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, eventful. So the it's funny when you're on my show. Uh, for some reason, when you were talking about your podcast and how you you talk about pop culture and different movies, Blue mm-hmm. Velvet just jumped in my head. So Blue Velvet is a 1986 movie uh, written and directed by David Lynch, mm-hmm. and it is. Um, it, it, first of all, it was my first exposure to David Lynch. I didn't see Dune because uh, Dune came out in 84, Blue Velvet 86. And I didn't see Dune until a few years after when it was like on HBO or something. But right. I saw um, Blue Velvet on video cassette, not in the in the theater. And I didn't know what I was getting into. And holy cow, is it a ride? It's Oh, yeah. It is so weird that, especially in the beginning. So l- l- let's talk about some people who are in this movie. Um, a, a very young Laura Dern was in this movie. Um, yep. She was 19 at the time. Kyle MacLachlan, um, one of his first roles, was in this movie, uh, who later went on to play Agent Cooper in um, Twin Peaks, one of my favorite shows ever. I um, think he also plays the mayor in Portlandia, which is a show I've been been watching recently. Oh, that's where yeah. I saw him from so, before. Okay. No so way. seeing seeing him super young, I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Especially was, in some of the situations that he gets into. But we'll get into the plot, I'm sure. Yeah, he was kind of hot, wasn't he? As a he was kind of hot. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, a, a young Brad Dorif, who's been in a lot of horror films. Uh, he was uh, the voice of no, he wasn't the voice of Chucky, was he? Was he? Um, he, he might the, have been. The thing that I know him better from is uh, he was Worm Tongue in the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah, okay, okay, mm-hmm. All right. yeah. So, um, you know, he had a small part in that. Um, Isabella Ra- Rossellini, who's gone on to do a lot of other things, one of her first roles, and then uh, we can't forget good old Dennis Hopper. Oh, no. uh, ooh, Dennis At Hopper his prime in this one. Yeah, and yeah. the funny thing is, is he was the third choice. Uh, of actors to play Frank. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was one guy I don't know, and um, Harry Dean Stanton was the second one, and he didn't take it because it was too violent. And then um, Dennis Hopper read the script, and he said, I have to play this because this is me. And that was him because (laughs) he was a drug-crazed maniac at the time of shooting. So I don't think David Lynch wanted him, though, from what from what I've heard. No, he did my research. He absolutely didn't want him. No, Uh, he didn't. And it was. Yeah, it was a thing of like, well, if he wants to do it, David, we should let him. And David's like, no, no, we don't. We don't need to let. No, come on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Before we get too far in, I want to talk about this in the bubble of uh, speaking to people who maybe haven't experienced Blue Velvet already. I would, of course, encourage those people. Um, to go ahead and pause the podcast. It's a three ninety nine rental. Go rent it, watch it, come back if if you want. If you don't want to, let's do a quick uh, plot synopsis just so we don't lose anybody on character names or uh, plots that we're talking about. Um, right. Um, so the the movie is it's set like a forties noir type film, and mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's partially modern day and partially. Uh, modern day for 1986 and partially in the 70s and even 60s when you look at the vehicles and stuff it's all mixed up he, it's he's a weird a... it's a weird love child of Casablanca and the breakfast club yeah if they yeah. were to have a baby movie yeah. yeah this is this is the atrocity that they would spit out <laughs> yes <laughs> With a lot of full frontal nudity and murder, yeah, it's, yes. it's yeah, it's it, it's re- it's really weird. But basically, so Kyle McLaughlin's dad, um, Kyle is what's his name? Is he Jerry? He's Jeffrey. 
Jeffrey, that's it. He's Jeffrey in this. Um, his dad looks like he has a stroke or something while he's watering the yard. Mm -hmm. So Jeffrey great, comes man. home from college and uh, he uh, meets Laura Dern. And mm -hmm. then um, we the see this little, daughter. Yeah, we see this little scene of just beetles burrowing in, in the earth. Um, yeah. that what the is hell is that about? <laughs> for, really, for a long period of time, it's this, this beautiful shot by shot of this like neighborhood, like white yeah. picket fences, like yeah. the firefighter driving by and waving. You're like, this is a beautiful suburban town. Yeah. Like, yeah, and exactly what you think of. Yeah. Then it, it goes deep into the ground under the perfect <laughs> green grass and you just see bugs and yeah. bugs and bugs crawling yeah. all yeah. over yeah. it. Like yeah. drones in the background too. And yeah. 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 And and it's at that moment you're like, oh, this is a David Lynch movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, this is going to be yeah. I can tell. <laughs> okay. This is going to mess me up real bad, isn't it? <laughs> and the Beatles were kind of what hooked me. So then uh, Jeffrey finds an ear, uh, just basically a disembodied ear, and it's got ants crawling all over it. Mm -hmm. And he takes that to. Looks like uh, rotting bread. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, it looks rough to Laura yeah. Dern's dad, and they mm -hmm. they do the thing and say, "Well, it looks like it was cut off with scissors," and but uh, they can't tell for sure if the person was dead when they cut it off or not. So then it just goes into this thing where Kyle McLaughlin wants to be a detective now and figure out what's going on, and he happens upon Isabella Rossellini, who. Um, is pretty much out of her mind because the ear belongs to her husband who was kidnapped and his her son is also kidnapped and she is uh really weird and not a very good singer uh, <laughs> yep. uh they they didn't yeah. uh they definitely didn't auto tune that voice uh but they <laughs> but they um he happens upon her and she pretty much seduces him uh right then and there and yeah. then and then he's kind of getting in the Laura Dern a little bit too at that point. Then he goes back and just, they just full on do it uh, after he hits her. Um, yes. And, and then he takes Laura Dern to a dance and then. Uh, it's important to note that um, while oh. hiding in the closet on the first meeting, um, yeah. he watches as Frank beats her and yeah. then. There's another scene yeah. that plays out. And this was the scene when watching it, I was like, what the hell have we gotten ourselves <laughs> I was into? like, oh, yeah. Because it's like full-on assault that happens for a very yeah. long time in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah. between... Which is Rough. Yeah, yeah. Between, between the car ride and the uh, and the apartment and the car ride was just absolutely nuts. So, so, yes. so during that time when Kyle McLaughlin is in the closet, we find out that Frank is one weird dude and, oh, yeah. and he's, he's, he's very controlling and yet he's also um, really just kind of a mealy mouth little jerk too. I mean, he, he wants stuff, but he can't really ask for it. It doesn't look like he can actually, um, actually have actual sex it looks like everything is done just by violence and mm -hmm. and he's always sucking on his oxygen and taking drugs and stuff like that so he goes through that with and his there's the the shoving the blue velvet in his mouth yeah that, yeah, he that likes keeps that. happening yeah, yeah. Hmm. And that shows up because she wears a blue velvet robe. Congrats. Yeah. We've made it to the movie title portion of the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, that's the title. <laughs> Yeah, but um, and then uh, I think it, it's uh, it's one of the times where Kyle is that after he and Isabella Rossellini just made love, and then uh, Frank and his crew show up. Is it or, the the no, neighbor the scene? Yeah, where they're like, "Hey, neighbor, how are yeah. you, neighbor?" Yeah. yeah, that's that's right after that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So he's, that he's leaving, and Frank's at the door. Yeah. And at that point, we pretty much know Frank is uh, Frank and his gang are the bad guys. Um, yeah. If we didn't, <laughs> didn't already if know we didn't before. Yeah. <laughs> and so they decide they're going to take uh, Kyle Jeffrey on a ride with Isabella Rossellini. And um, they go to the apartment first and the uh, apartment where her child is being held. And uh, they By a man named Eddie, right? Is that yeah. his name? Yeah, and Eddie uh, is my yeah, favorite character in the whole movie. <laughs> Boy, he so really suave. stole the show for me. So suave. 
He was so um, suave, this guy. <laughs> played by Dean Stockwell, who uh, later on went to do, what was that show with um, the guy who went back in time? Mm. It'll, it'll come to me anyway it's happened it, it, so many times it, it was doctor another, who? i think it was like no it wasn't doctor who it was it was like a 90s show um but anyway he he went on to play a very normal person and um but in it's this a, he, he plays a very rocky rocky horror-esque character yeah. like and he's, full and he face makeup in, and yeah he sings into a shop light and everybody really likes that uh mm -hmm. he actually karaoke's into a shop light but yeah he's got got the light and he's singing into it but that whole that whole cast of characters is just odd you got a guy dancing with a snake you got uh you got isabella rossellini and the kid doesn't even know her anymore you got mm -hmm. um all these women that just seem to be like babysitters that don't talk they, they they're have, all mother like figures they yeah. all look very yeah. like maternal like not yeah. sexy they're just like they're like grandmothers yeah is what they kind of look like yeah right definitely. Then they go on the big ride and they kick the crap out of Kyle Jeffrey and leave him uh, just sitting there. And when he wakes up, he looks like he's in a lot better shape than when he originally fell down. I'll have to say that he he doesn't look like he got punched as many times as he did. Um, and, and then Frank kisses him on the mouth like eight or nine yeah. times, which oh, is yeah. something that happens. He puts on lipstick and says, "I have to get pretty, 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 pretty," yeah. and then like makes out with Kyle McLaughlin and yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I just watched this today and I forgot that part. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Maybe I'm blocking it out. Yeah. I would. <laughs> <laughs> but this all, I, I mean, really the plot c culminates in, uh, uh, Kyle, you know, chasing after Frank and then getting Laura Dern, who's the chief of police's, uh, dad involved and uh frank turns out to be two people he's dressed up as another guy that kyle took pictures of one mm -hmm. of the cops that uh laura the well-dressed man yeah mm -hmm. uh yeah though he's a well-dressed man with the he kind of looks like uh um what's his name from schitt's creek um uh D dan levy yeah uh actually eugene the dad eugene yeah. levy yeah yeah i thought he kind of looked like uh andy kaufman's alter ego a little bit, yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. But basically, I mean, it all. I mean, there's a big gunfight, um, and they're not even going after the right, right guy because Frank's back going to Isabella Rossellini's apartment, and mm -hmm. um, Kyle McLaughlin is again hiding in the closet after saying that he was in the bedroom because he knew that Frank had a walkie-talkie, police radio in his yeah. car, yeah. Yeah, and so Frank's and this whole looking time, for him. This whole time, yeah. Kyle McLaughlin's trying to save Rosalina. That like that's his whole plot is mm -hmm. like I need the cops to save this woman and rescue yeah. uh, the husband and the the son from the closet. Like right. that's his big like motivation. Yeah. I don't think the husband made it, but uh nope. <laughs> yeah. I know he didn't. We we see his dead body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh the funny thing is is uh when he's so the the pretty much one of the final scenes is he's waiting in the closet for Frank to come up and Frank's shooting all over the place, uh thinking he's gonna hit him. And then Frank notices he's probably in the closet, he opens the door. Kyle's got a 38 revolver and shoots him in the head. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the most graphic headshots I've ever seen because the bullet goes in the front and you never you you, you usually never see what goes on in the back of the head. You don't um, want to trust me. <laughs> sometimes you'll see blood on the wall uh, behind it, but this showed the head mushrooming out. Mm -hmm. uh, because the bullet came out. I've never seen anything like that mm -hmm. since this movie and. Then it just goes into the end, which is actually fairly normal. Um, what I really dug about this movie, this is the first time I had ever seen anything David Lynch, and I'm I'm pretty weird. I like old horror movies and stuff like that. Um, but this was really shocking for 1986. I mean, oh yeah, there was it's shocking for 2021. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> We're talking like. At the time, people stuck their nose up at Heather's, which was about like teen suicide. Mm -hmm. And you watch a guy blow himself up, but you really don't watch it. You just know it happens. Yeah. And people were like, oh, this is so scandalous. And then David Lynch is like, 
I'm sorry. Did you want to see a woman get sexually assaulted and a guy get his head blown off? Because yeah. I made that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. And I just what what he does, what David Lynch does, and he does this with everything, is he treads on the edge of normal just long enough that what he throws at you that is totally sick and twisted just snaps you. It just snaps mm -hmm. your neck. You're like, WTF, baby. I, I don't yep. know what's going on. And then he goes back into it, a little bit normal, yeah. a little bit okay, and then, bam, he hits you again. And that he seems to have a rhythm with that, and mm -hmm. almost everything he does seems to have that. I mean, there's normal conversation, you know, um, uh, Kyle and Laura Dern are just having a real nice conversation at the coffee shop diner and um, nothing really scandalous goes on there. And then, you know, it goes on to him finding Isabella Ros Rossellini and, um, you know, she just wants to get hit. Um, and <laughs> and it's just it's just so it's so bizarre. And you really get sucked into it. It's one of those movies when you're watching it, you don't like um, want to do anything else. You don't want to mm -hmm. like you, you're, you're so sucked into it that you're just totally focused on it. And the other thing I noticed because I haven't so 1990, so I haven't seen it for 30 some years. Um, it holds up. It, oh, yeah. It, it, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't it, it doesn't feel dated at all. As well, disgusting no, as any, it is, any, anything yeah. that you, any anything that you would think would be like dated just comes across as like part of the surrealism of the movie. Yeah, because and it probably it probably has something to do with the fact that it was a movie from the eighties that was set in the nineteen fifties. Like mm -hmm. that yeah. probably helps with the fact that it's timeless because it wasn't set yeah. in the time it was made. And the automobiles, if you look at the automobiles, they are from that ambulance is from the 60s all mm -hmm. the way up through the late 70s and are actually the mid 70s. But the boom box that uh, Harry Dean Stanton is using to sing with is from the 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from 86. So it's really weird how he mixed all that stuff up. And I, I, I know it was intentional because he's very meticulous about what he does and what he puts out there and it's it's where you don't know what year it is you you absolutely yeah. don't know yeah i just kind of figured that so, was more chalked up to the fact that like everything from the 80s didn't just pop into existence like right at 1980 right you had stuff from the 60s and 70s and 50s still laying around yeah but not least. ambulances i mean i don't know yeah, i was alive back then so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I watched uh, I watched an interview with David Lynch that really opened this movie up for me. It was like that that smell of fine wine or like dripping water in bourbon where you're like, here are all the tastes. Yeah, um, it was the the movie is a dream. David Lynch says he says um, it is a dream I once had and I gripped on too hard enough that I was able to make it into a movie. He uh -huh. said it basically worked out that I dreamt it. And then I made it. Yeah. So there are things in it that only make sense in dreams. And uh -huh. it, there's a there's a point to that. Like the fact that um uh Kyle, the the girl from the high school who Kyle is courting around, when she's first introduced, she comes sle sleeking out of the shadows and yeah. knows uh about she knows Kyle's name, she knows where Kyle lives, she knows Kyle's house and like and its directions. <laughs> from um the apartment that they're going to be staking out she mm. knows all of that and it's not questioned just like how in a dream if information is presented to you you don't go how did you get that information or like how do you know that you're just like oh yeah that makes sense yeah and you you don't <laughs> yeah. question it and <laughs> another example of that is um when they're all hanging out at eddie's apartment um if you if you remember they didn't exit eddie's apartment they were there and then they weren't yeah, then they were in the car. Yeah. Then yeah. they were in the car. And yeah. it's it's that moment in a dream where you're thinking about going somewhere and then you're already there and your brain yeah. just makes the connection where you're like, oh, I must have just like dozed off during the part where we got <laughs> to the car. Mm -hmm. um, but those yeah. choices that he made, like you said, were very intentional. It was to set the standard of you're in a dream right now. You're going to mm -hmm. have to deal with that. But watch mm -hmm. as the movie plays out in this dream. Yeah. Hmm. 
and the and the way it goes out with uh with it uh the um close up on Kyle McLaughlin's ear mm-hmm. and and fades out that kind of that kind of sets it up at the end okay maybe this was a dream yeah yeah mm-hmm. well another interesting thing about that is the adventure starts with um a really long shot that zooms in to the uh decapitated ear yeah. that's rotting it zooms in to it to the point where it goes to black because it gets yeah. so close inside of the ear that's the beginning bookend the end bookend is coming back out of an ear but it's kyle mclaughlin's and it's like pristine and beautiful and alive mm. but when you go in it's uh it's rotting and gross and dark mm. But but that bookends the entire story is yeah. going into into yeah. the mind and then coming back out of it almost like David Lynch was like here's my sick and twisted mind but on the yeah. outside it's just a normal ear. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. of Jimmy Neutron for there for a minute. <laughs> but it's but yeah, it's like brain blast. Blast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was just really taken in by. It. Once again, the the fact that they they could tread on the line of normalcy and then just pull you away from it, except for when Frank was there. I mean, when when Frank was uh, Dennis Hopper, as Frank was in the f- frame, you know yeah. something nutty was going to happen. And mm-hmm. uh, apparently, there was some um, there was some controversy because uh, David Lynch was nominated for an Oscar for that film, but uh, Dennis Hopper, I don't believe, was nominated for a best supporting role. Um, and he, a lot of people thought that he deserved it, uh, for, for that role. Um, even though I don't think he was playing, I, I think, I think he was just being Dennis Hopper because right. I don't think, I don't think he got clean until the nineties. So yeah. So yeah, I, I think he was just being good old Dennis Hopper and, um, putting lipstick on him and uh, Kyle and just having some fun. Yeah. His, his role in the movie it's it didn't have to be scripted if it was scripted which i feel uh, was probably one of the reasons why david lynch was like we don't we don't need dennis hopper um yeah. was because he he was so meticulous in his lines that he wrote and what he wanted um i think back to that first scene we have with the uh investigator uh-huh. uh, where kyle is like in the room with the investigator it was a really long shot where the investigator did not break eye contact. He did not blink. He did not look Mm. away. He didn't file paperwork. His attention was fully on Kyle Mm. and it did not break off of Kyle the entire time to the port Mm. to the point where I was like, this is weird that he's just staring him down. And it's like line after line after line. But the point that I'm getting to is I think he's so meticulous in his writing that if anything was improv, he'd be like, take that out. That can't be. Yeah. And I really wondered about that because I, I can see everything being scripted except for Dennis Hopper stuff. I, you know, and, but I know David Lynch is very in control of his scripts and very in mm-hmm. control of his show. So, you know, obviously he, he would have kept Dennis Hopper in line, but man, it was just so Dennis Hopper. I, yeah. I, I felt like I was just seeing him on a normal day. Yeah. <laughs> a normal day. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to bring up another point. Um, and it, so I'm going to ask a, a general question. I want to see what you guys uh, have an answer to. It's a little mini game. So <laughs> if I, if I ask you the question, I want to get all of your answers and I hope they're not the same. Um, but I want to end on Scott cause Scott might know the actual answer. Um, if I were to ask you the question, what do you think David Lynch's favorite movie is not of his, but just in general, if you had to take a stab in the dark, what movie would you assign to David Lynch to be like, this is probably his favorite movie? Hmm. I want to say something about like uh, Albert Hitchcock, like okay. The Birds or uh, Psycho. And I think this, that he has a lot of that in, in his in his yeah. movies. Yeah, just because, I mean, they're, they're the obviously gruesome parts of it. And there's the part where like inside the mind of a psycho, the whole scene with the, the shower and the stabbing. Like that's mm-hmm. iconic. And I think those came out in the sixties too. So they predated. He might've watched them. Who knows? Yeah. That's maybe. my answer. I'll lock it in. I'll lock it in. Michael, what do you think? <laughs> I really have no idea. <laughs> like, that's I, fair. I can't 
think of anything that like I can see a little bit of like the psycho like influence in there, but like anything else is so unique to David Lynch. Mm-hmm. That, like for me, I don't think of like other movies when I think of David Lynch. I think of like uh, like TV shows and soap operas and uh, like things of that nature that he like kind of uses to frame his absurdity, uh, mm. but nothing else that I can really think of. Okay. It's kind of Scott, hard. What do you what do you think? No, I don't know. Um, I okay. I did not look this up, and I I haven't checked that out. But I would say Wizard of Oz. Ooh, that's the correct answer. <laughs> I, <laughs> no shit, Scout's Honor. I didn't. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't look it up. No shit. His favorite movie. He's gone on record and saying that it is Wizard of Oz. It's huh. a good film, so, I guess. <laughs> So here's something that I love doing with most art forms. And if you listen to any episode of the podcast that they leave me in charge of, you'll know that the first thing I do when writing about a specific thing is I look to its creator and I try to look at the piece of art through the lens of the creator. Mm -hmm. So with this frame of his favorite movie is Wizard of Oz and you look at Blue, you start to kind of put together pieces of maybe what was going through his mind. Um, of course, there is the dream sequence of like, oh, it was all a dream. Oh, it's not real. Oh, it's fantasy. Oh, but I'm more importantly, <laughs> something about Wizard of Oz that's um, prominent is the duality of the characters. Every yeah. character that she meets in the Wizard of Oz or in, in the Land of Oz uh, is an actual character back in um, Kansas. And there are, there are connections to each of them. The Wicked Witch is the one who's coming to take her dog and like so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this movie, in my opinion, plays with that too. Um, every character in the bright sunshiny overworld, the the green grass, white picket fence, um, all of those characters have their equal parts in the dark grungy bug filled underneath. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, uh, detective's daughter, her opposite of course is the lounge room singer. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm. In blue velvet, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, and you can draw a connection to Frank immediately with Jeffrey. They're two separate sides of the coin. So the question is, what happens when they get too close? What happens when you put two magnets together? Yeah, like they they if they aren't in the same like magnet sphere, they separate and explode with all this <laughs> energy. Attract man, Paul yeah. dual set. right, right. <laughs> But that being said, any scene where you see, if you were to split this down the middle and put each character with their reflective character, any scene you see two characters who are supposed to be reflections of each other meet, there is a mental breakdown that happens with those characters. Mm -hmm. Anytime that Frank meets Jeffrey, he loses his goddamn mind. And might I remind you when the, I don't know their exact names, but when the lounge singer shows up to the house of the girl from high school, the girl from high school has an entire breakdown and it makes sense with the plot, but also that's her polar opposite. This is the goody girl who you have a future with who you're in love with Jeffrey. But on the other side, on the dark and gritty underworld that you've found yourself in where maybe you don't belong, this is your Oz. This is the dark mysterious girl who you have no future with, but are also very attracted to. They're both similar. What so looking through it like that, what does what does Frank see in the lounge singer that like Jeffrey sees in the high school girl, you know? Hmm. So I I think there was a lot of that into writing this movie. Yeah. And I felt like um, first off, I felt like uh, Kyle was actually attracted to her where uh, Frank was. It was more like a mother figure. Mm -hmm. um almost um another thing though that you reminded me of there's a scene where isabella rosalini had been beat up probably by frank and she's naked um outside of uh jeffrey's house and Mm -hmm. um and uh they no outside of uh 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 what's her name Dern's house, Laura Dern's house. Yeah, Laura and, Dern. And and they bring her in. This is the weirdness of how people react. They bring her in only the mom's home. Mm-hmm. And uh there she is naked and and Laura Dern says, Call an ambulance. And 
her mom looks at as Isabel, Isabella Rossellini and looks at uh, Kyle and she's like, all right. She doesn't she doesn't freak out at all. It's like, okay, this this type of stuff happens all the time. I it's I'll that dream state him. again. Yeah. It's yeah. like when you're in your when you're in the dream and someone's like, This is happening, we should do something. Yeah. And everyone's yeah. just like, We should, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Why are you freaking out? What's your problem? And yeah. and how fast did that ambulance show up? Within minutes, like they oh, were yeah. down the street. Yeah. Again, it's it's that this is a dream. I so that, that like, kind I'll, of and then she's like, I'll get her a coat. It's like no, I mean no emotion. And she's like, "Oh, here we are again. I'll get yeah. her a coat." <laughs> it's incredible. Jeez. But kind of going back to the lens of duality that we're talking about, um, because you mentioned, um, the the he was actually attracted to um to Laura Dern's character, where Frank was uh more kind of self obsessed and everything. I think it's important to note that um there was opposite in that as well because uh frank needed the lounge singer much like laura dern's character uh needed jeffrey it was yeah. swapped so mm -hmm. in the relationship that jeffrey was in uh dern desperately wanted the affection of jeffrey even though he was giving it to someone else now that was happening in the land of oz or the dark side as mm -hmm. well but it was the opposite because um the the lounge singer was giving her attention to Jeffrey. And because of that, the male in the relationship was fighting to gain that attention back. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it even goes as far to say that um, there is a duality between uh, Rosalina's husband and Laura Dern's boyfriend, because both yeah. Frank, both Frank and Jeffrey walked into relationships that were already pre-established and yeah. broke them up either yeah. through force or just by existing. Yeah. Hmm. So that's the story that we're looking at is what happens when these two worlds collide in an apocalyptic way. <laughs> what happens to the characters and who makes it out and who doesn't? Because yeah. there's this thing with time travel that I think Futurama dealt with best, but it's like if there are two of the same person in the same universe, they can't both coexist. And you watch as one of the universes gets completely destroyed. That's what Blue Velvet is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. setting this up, I it's funny because I am not much of a consumer of media. I okay. I don't I don't watch a whole bunch of TV. I don't watch a lot of movies. I, I, I'm I, I read a lot more than I do anything. But um, that movie, you know, I think of the movies that. I remember from either my childhood or growing up, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz is one of them. Cool Hand Luke is one of them. Blue Velvet's one of them. Apocalypse mm -hmm. Now. The, all, all those movies, um, you know, uh, the original Frankenstein series, uh, all that stuff, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, all that stuff really sticks with me. And um, some of it is, and the, most of it is pretty weird stuff. Even even Cool Hand Luke has some weird stuff to it. Oh, yeah. And uh, and um, it's it, it confirms the fact that I'm weird. But also, <laughs> I mean, it, it's so funny. I I don't know if any of you guys have watched any of Twin Peaks, but this movie is Twin Peaks. It's oh, yeah. exactly the same way he directed and wrote twin peaks. It's almost like he took this movie and just expanded it and put a few different characters in. And some of the same characters, one of the, one of uh, Frank's henchmen was Jack Nance who played in twin peaks. He was uh, uh, Pete Martell in twin peaks. Um, so it's, it's really funny because twin peaks was very much like that. It, it, it would, uh, teeter on the edge of normalcy for a mm -hmm. few minutes and then all of a sudden everything would just freak out and yeah. get really weird and uh kyle mclaughlin i you know i i look at how much he liked heineken's in uh blue velvet yeah, oh yeah honest. yeah for no reason even when they were like they were like yeah. what kind of beer you like a neighbor and like where the rest <laughs> of us would be like uh whatever's fine he was like yeah. i like heineken and he's like heineken you idiot heineken. <laughs> <Half> <laughs> blue ribbon. Blue ribbon. 
Yeah, everything <laughs> blue with that guy. He loves everything blue. Yeah, and then in uh, Twin Peaks, it's coffee. He was absolutely, absolutely obsessed with coffee. So it's it's kind of funny. If you watch those and you watch at least the first season of T- Twin Peaks, you're like, oh, my God, this is the same stuff. It's mm-hmm. it, it's just been rewritten for different people. Man, thinking thinking back on that Heineken scene, not not the one where he was asking for Heineken. It was the uh-huh. one where he was like. They were at they were doing their investigation. It's the first time that they're at that the the slowdown, mm-hmm. I think is what it's called, which has its own duality uh, with the the diner that the kids are eating in. One's mm-hmm. painted red, one's painted blue, which is an ongoing theme in this movie is the uh-huh. difference between red and blue. But um, yeah. oh, yeah, no, it goes deep. I, I can I can put on my tinfoil hat all day with this thing. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the first time they're at the lounge place, he's like. Ooh, I love the cold, refreshing drink of a Heineken. And he like pushes the label out and it's like, yeah. is this a Heineken commercial? Why <laughs> is this so placement? out What's of here? place? It's so weird. <laughs> it really did feel like Heineken had their hand in, in David Lynch's pocket for this, but I don't think it was for any other reason than David Lynch wrote it in. Yeah. Heineken's yeah. okay. Which, let's be, let's I don't be know. Honest. Well, I don't know. It's if you go back to the whole dream theory, like for me, like when I have dreams, there sometimes is like a certain fixation that I'll have on like mm-hmm. one thing that allows me to like cling to like reality. Mm-hmm. And like just the brand name Heineken could have been it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Could be. I could see that for sure. How about when Frank pulls him up to the bar that, that they go to and he says, this is it. And the sign in the window the sign, is yeah. this is it in red, of course. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that's again back to the whole dream thing. Like you hear yeah. something and then it appears yeah. and you're like, oh, well, it makes it? sense oh, because what is, what is the it referencing? Just what is the this? line. This is it is it's like, like this is the a... this is the place. But then the sign confirms like this is it. This is the place. This it's is the so, place. because because dreams can be very generic because everything everything else is important is uh heightened and everything that's unimportant is generic so the talking about being in a dream state this is it well we're gonna call the bar this is it because the name of it doesn't matter uh right yeah yeah i think i think i'm i'm rolling back on the whole it starts with you entering an ear and ends with you exiting an ear (laughs) in one ear Um, not the other right yeah (laughs) well it 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 is the same ear though that's important if you look at the structures of the ear which is the most nerdy fucking thing we've ever said on this podcast (laughs) um if you look at the ears it's they're both the same ear so i don't think it's like an in one ear out the other one thing it's like a um David Lynch is like, hey, just so you know, you're about to go into my mind. How do you get to my mind? Through my gross fucking ear. Through the ear. Yeah. Get in How? there. <laughs> get, in my, get in my head. And that's where the story happens. It almost leads you at the end when you exit out Kyle MacLachlan's ear, like the, the nice, clean, healthy ear, where you're like, did this actually happen? Or is this just a daydream that he had while sitting in this recliner thinking about what a more exciting life would be than living in the suburbs. Yeah. You know? And, and Kyle McLaughlin's ear, if that truly is his ear is kind of weird. It's got like an extra little thing before the lobe. It's got a a little cavernous thing. That's bigger than most people's. It's actually an odd shaped ear. I remember staring at it when they were zooming out and being like, what am I looking at? What (laughs) is this? Yeah. I still, I just, I didn't know it was an ear until I saw hair and I was like, oh, okay. It's, yeah, I get it now. Yeah. (laughs) So I felt like this movie was, it it was odd and disturbing. Um, Mm -hmm. However, it, it didn't leave me with a bad feeling afterwards. It didn't make, it it didn't make me, you know how some movies just make you feel kind of sick inside Um, Mm -hmm. and, and like saw something like saw it just, it just feels like, violence for no reason and stuff like that you know i i left the movie thinking eh, it was a it was a really really good movie and i don't even though bad stuff happened in it i don't feel bad as a person for watching it and yeah and that's the way i am with almost everything david lynch now it's it's weird it's so weird but i don't and even though weird stuff that i would never do happens i don't feel like a bad person for watching it yeah, yeah. we were we were texting about it yeah, it's kind of we, weird to the point where 
it's off-putting to a lot of people like the generic you know audience yeah take me for example i'm pretty i'm a pretty vanilla type of guy and when he i got goes done to bed with at 9 30 he wakes up at 8 a.m every day yep, doesn't matter if it's saturday chicken, sunday it doesn't matter that kind of stuff go to church every day <laughs> and uh so when i got done with the movie i texted alex i was like that was rough <laughs> <laughs> he said he said rough rough is a good word for it i remember after i watched i'm I sorry said, I, I did that to you nick oh, it's, it's okay <laughs> i i watched i watched it and i was like hey i just watched blue velvet and he was like oh did you watch it alone and i was like yep watched it by myself and he was like should because he hadn't watched it yet he's like should i watch it naked i said wear extra clothes you should wear more <laughs> layers you do not want to walk into this exposed um i'm glad i did <laughs> yeah because yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's uh, a lot of things about yeah. it are rough because it's not like your typical like, compare this to like a Marvel movie or something like that. Like mm -hmm. all the dialogue, it, it flows. It, it has a flow to it. You know, you have the hero, the villain, they're talking. It's very believable. You can kind of suspend your disbelief for a minute. Mm -hmm. This movie, I constantly had this dialogue in the back of my head. that was like, that doesn't seem like good acting. And I don't know acting. I'm not a film critic or anything yeah. like that. I, I actually think that because he was going with the, the 40s noir type thing, if you go back to a 40s noir black and white movie, um, they don't act very well. They act like it's in the 40s. He wanted them. I think he asked them to tone it down um, wow. and say, don't act so good. I, I I honestly think that because Laura Dern is a great actress and, you know, she's she's got the pedigree in her family and, uh, you know, she was very wooden, um, very um, um, it, it was almost like soap opera like uh, yeah. Yeah. some yeah. of the dialogue. And I think he wanted that. Well, it plays into the whole dichotomy of like lull you into a sense of like normalcy to just like slap you in the face with crazy David Lynchness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it was completely visual, all the shocking shit that was happening. Yeah. It wasn't shit people were saying. It was what you were watching them do as they were like delivering these like flat faced, respectful lines. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's why I think I love the Eddie title so for much. this. Uh, yeah. I think Michael has a title for this total David Lynchness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally wicked. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. This is Blue Velvet, total David Lynchness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even talking about yeah. it now, it's like I'm having <laughs> like flashbacks to last night where I was just, I don't know, that film took something out of me when I got done. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't so do anything. That, that means you and I are two very different people because I, yeah. I felt pretty good afterwards. So uh, <laughs> it's not a so, film for everyone. I'll say that much. Yeah. Know? So so let's let let's let me ask this of everyone. Um, and I'll start with Nick. After seeing that, would you want to watch anything else by David Lynch? <sighs> In short, <laughs> it's no. okay to say yeah. It's okay but, to say no. But if the premise is good enough, like it's not because I'm not into crime movies and mm -hmm. like who done it type of stuff. But if the premise was right and the price was right, then, I, then I'd watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. How about you, Michael? Uh, I mean, I I had already seen to, like some of Twin Peaks. And so like I knew going into this what David Lynch was like. And like for me, yeah, it's yeah like right did up you in see that, the like, similarities uh in, oh, yeah. in 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 the way he cross he you know he just teeters that edge and and brings the weirdness sure. in yeah how about For you sure. alex um i think i'm too deep now i have this <laughs> this weird <laughs> this Paul's weird jealousy. obsession with trying to figure everything out and make it make sense to me and i yeah. think david lynch openly tries to avoid people doing that yes. but i'm i'm on i'm on the case now i'm yeah. my own jeffrey is what's happened. <laughs> I'm gonna go deep into the into the mud and the dirt to try to figure uh, it out. Steve was on the case. <laughs> so yeah, I'd I'd watch more of it just to figure David Lynch out more. Yeah, I would recommend going the Twin Peaks route for for your next one. And yeah. uh, I mean, there's there there's some great stuff in there. Mulholland Drive, and there's one with uh, Nick Cage and Laura Dern that's great. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, also. Cousin? No, uh, no, yeah, no, no, David Lynch didn't direct that. If <laughs> but he yeah, would have, it would have been so much better. Yeah, <laughs> it would have been so yeah. cool. It would yeah. have been real cool if he did. Benjamin Franklin gets shot in the face. And just yeah, <laughs> no Benjamin doubt. Franklin is the villain at the end. 
I'm on the hundred dollar bill. Deal with it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I do believe David Lynch. You you either like him or you don't like him, and mm -hmm. you 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 can really get sucked in. I feel like Alex probably just got sucked in, and he's going to be a student of David Lynch and never ever understand it because I don't think Lynch even understands it. No, but uh, I don't yeah, know. he's he. he <laughs> I may. Yeah. Once yeah. I, I think once I crack that egg, there's no coming back from it. Yeah. Though. I think yeah. like at that point, I'm wandering the streets with my underwear on my head and like <laughs> yelling nonsensical words to the clouds. Singing, yeah. singing blue you know? velvet. And... <laughs> right. So if you're going to go in deep, will you pledge to tell me what you see and, and, and what you think about it? I will. I will <laughs> let you know the minute David Lynch crosses my eyes again. <laughs> right. Do you solemnly yeah, swear? For sure. Well... <laughs> Scott, you brought so much to the table for us, and it yeah. was it was a delight to take on this challenge that you ushered, um, and to talk about it with you. Uh, and we thank you for coming on our podcast. It has been a a blast. Um, before we go to our promotional segment, I want to give it to you, Scott. If there's anything that you want to promote outright, just send people to your social medias. Please go ahead. Yeah, just look up behind the bits on everything. I'm the btbpc.com for my website because somebody stole behind the bits and all my social media. You can get to it from there. But uh, and also on Twitter, I am btbpc. So just uh, just find me there. Behind the bits is easy to find. Just type it in on any podcast app and you can listen to it. The BTB Internet Talk Show is a little bit different. It's only on Twitch, and it's on the Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling channel. So mm -hmm. type in Drinks, Jokes, the letter N, Storytelling, and follow them because they have a lot of great shows. Mine isn't one of them, but they have a lot of great shows with a lot of great comedians. Um, uh, a buddy of mine just uh, interviewed Mike Farrell, um, who was BJ Honeycutt on MASH, um, uh, interviewed him yesterday. And Loretta wow. Swick called in, um, who was Hot Lips on MASH. So that's the type of stuff that they've got going on. And then they let me play there, too. So a really great <laughs> channel. Um, they've got stuff seven days a week. And he keeps adding new stuff. Tom, the guy that runs the channel, adds mm -hmm. new stuff all the time. Um, but the BTB Internet Talk Show, if you want to turn your brain off and think about Dean Martin and have awkward silences, it's a great show to watch. <laughs> yeah, we miss old Deanie. He was fun. Yeah. He was fun right. on... Uh... And, and you guys can go again to our YouTube channel if you want to catch our appearance. Oh, oh my God, it's Dean Martin. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Where, when did uh, you get here? I watched I, I watch that uh, goddamn Blue Velvet movie with Scott, and uh, <laughs> uh, it, it ain't nothing like Matt Helm, I'll tell you that. Oh, uh, true, uh, true that. It's way too much nudity. I mean, come on. Leave a little bit to the imagination. Uh, I'm Dean Martin. Hey, <laughs> D Dean, do you, <laughs> Dean, do you have anything to promote? Have you been working on anything new, or is it just the old stuff? I've been working on getting some goddamn meat. Uh, this guy doesn't have any meat in the house, and uh, <laughs> uh, chickpeas, chickpeas and quinoa. I, I, I'm sick of it. And I, I know if I go to Burger King, I'm going to get recognized, and people are going to want my autograph and stuff, and say, "Hey, I thought you were dead." No, I wasn't. I'm not dead. I was cryogenically frozen, and that's why I'm living with Scott because all my money's gone. And I show up on the BTB Internet Talk Show all the time, all the time, yeah. because that's the only thing that's fun for me. Yeah, see, for sure. See how much see how much I look like I used to. <laughs> see, I the see only it. thing missing is the hair, I think. Yeah, my rosacea is killing that. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple of things before we go on our on our promotional break. Um, check out the scene snobs dot com. Uh, that's our network. We, uh, we signed with them at the beginning of this year, and it has been all uphill ever since. Uh, they're the reason that we've been nominated for all these awards and. Um, mm -hmm. The reason we've met so many amazing people, Scott included. So uh, check them out. Give them some love. Um, check out the Snobby Awards that's happening April 25th on uh, all the Scene Snob platforms. So if you've watched our live show, you can check out the award show, too. It's going to be a blast. Uh, if they need us to make an appearance, I will wear a full uh, three-piece suit because, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I will. I'll do it, or I'll wear tweed if that's what you want. I'll do whatever you say. I'll clap like a monkey and catch food in my mouth. Whatever you want. I'm there. I got you. So go check that stuff out. Um, 
other than that, let's throw it over to our video promotions and we get back. Uh, Michael, I believe you have a quick this for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. All okay. righty. So we'll be right back. Justin Wallace, Mitch Glasgow, and Deanna Cosby. Three daily commuters are joining forces to create the comedy podcast known as Carpool Shenanigans. Each week we'll take a topic, tell a story, and hopefully make your drive to work just a little less shitty. Now the episode's about to begin, so we ask that you sit back, relax, and of course, let's get weird. Hey, Cammy. Hey, Bryant. What do Robin Hood, Vlad the Impaler, and Mothman have in common? IDK, what? Well, they're all topics on our podcast, Mystery, where each week we discuss a new myth and the history behind it. That's Myth Story with an I-E. See you then. Oh. We love the folks over at Myth Story, but it does bother me that there's no S at the end of that or they didn't go with the Y. <laughs> I think that they would take that criticism like a champ. I just don't understand. And it it freaks me out every time I see it. Scott, if go for us, we'll have you on every episode. We're looking for new ones anyway. These are these are running dry. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime All you right. want to have me, I'm good. Yeah, for sure. Uh Michael, I'm throwing I'm throwing you a, a fastball here. Knock it out of the park. Hey, funny you say that because I've been spending a lot of time this last like two weeks getting back. Hold on, your into... timer's not ready. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to yeah, talk yeah. about baseball. I'm going it right now. Shut up. We shut only up. we Come only on. give him five <laughs> minutes. For those of you who haven't watched the show before, he only has five minutes, and he will be cut off abruptly as the mm -hmm. long hook thing. His uh, box cord. The, yeah, we we were going to pull <laughs> the cord on him. Hey, go. All right, so. So I, I've been spending a lot of time this last like week or two. I've been getting back into the world, being reaccumulated with things. And uh, one of the things that I've had the pleasure of getting to do was I got invited to be a part of a small beer league like softball team. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I so I grew up playing baseball. Like that was one of the things that like my dad from like I, the time I was like could stand, he put a baseball bat in my hands and put, took me out to like a tee in the backyard to hit a baseball. And it was one of those things like I developed a really early love of the sport. Um, I loved uh, going to like Reds games because we all grew up in Cincinnati and going and watching people like Barry Larkin, Ken Griffey Jr. go and play baseball to like the highest ability. And the Reds looking good this year. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Surprisingly, yeah. Um, and I had forgotten for a long time because, like, after you kind of stop playing baseball, just going and, like, watching the games, like, going to the games can be fun. But if you just want to, like, tune in to the sport to go watch it on, like, ESPN or something or other, like, it gets boring very quickly. Um, it's just a very hard sport to just stay in tune with. Well... Uh, over the last like few weeks or so, I found a YouTube channel called John Boy Media. Um, the thing that I really like about John Boy is that he makes baseball all about the people, uh, like the players, the managers, the coaches, the umps, all of that. And that is where the true entertainment value of baseball is, is all of the little feuds that can happen, the relationships that have been established and just how interesting it can be and a lot of the times it ends up devolving into just like angry jock goes <laughs> and, and it's just like two cavemen just barking back and forth with each other of just like how much like they're what they say was right and what you say is wrong and but doing so in like ways that only John boy can kind of like do because he his main shtick that he's really good at is lips uh lip reading <laughs> and so he provides like essentially a live camera view, live video footage of the game and all of the mic'd up moments that we would we would never get because, you know, I don't know if you'll ever spend any time in a like high school dugout or on a any sort of sports team. Lots of foul language that is not appropriate for television. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> so one of the things that I love doing is tuning into John Boy and just seeing like um, a really prominent guy that is like because all the only exposure we see of him is like through the media uh, and through this filtered persona is seeing him uh, just like real upstanding. But John Boy comes in and you get to see everything. It's all just like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck that. No, I'm right. You're wrong. All of that. Hey, will you bleep all those out for us, Nick? <laughs> uh, I don't get paid enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, and to kind of go along with John Boy, because that was what really sparked my my interest back into baseball and like being mm-hmm. able to watch it consistently. Um, along with that, I've been watching a lot of uh, Trevor Bauer's personal blog. So if you don't know who Trevor Bauer is, uh, he was one of the star pitchers for the Reds last year. Mm -hmm. Um, he won the national league Cy Young award in which the Cy Young award is basically saying you were the best pitcher in baseball. Um, so a guy who's playing at the highest of the high levels and the guy is just an absolute troll of a human being. Like he like gets (laughs) off on just like playing mental games with the other people, uh, that he's going up against. So he'll do things like he will in the middle of like a big high stakes game, he'll pitch with one eye closed. Uh, or he'll tell the batter like what pitch is coming just to get into their head and play that mental game. Uh, that reminds me he, of that MMA fighter who used to bring flowers to the people he was going to fight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can um, kiss her head and be like, I love you, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Trevor Bauer, he has his own personal vlog where he outlines everything that is going on through his head all the way from the off season to spring training and then the actual games. And it's just so incredibly fascinating. Like you start off with John boy, where you get a sense of what is actually happening in the games between the players. And then you get an actual player's perspective on 15 seconds. It. And for me, it has made me fall back in love with the game. Something that I haven't felt about it since I was probably like 10 or 12. Yeah. <laughs> it really is the, the people of the sport that, that mm-hmm. makes you stick around. Yeah, you hit uh, five minutes pretty much on the dot. So well done to you. Um, thank you. Scott, we want to thank you again for coming on our show. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, I guess if I continue my David Lynch travels, you'll have to come back on the show so that I can yell more nonsense at you. That's yeah. That's going to have to be what we do. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate how deep you dug into the whole David Lynch universe because I didn't even dig that deep. And I think Nick is uh, probably scared to go any deeper. And, and, <laughs> and Michael's all worried about baseball. So, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I think I think this dude up here is probably as weird as I am. And uh, we're kind of hard to find. Yeah, but we do make for great entertainment. That yeah. being said, uh, <laughs> if there's anything out there, kind of like uh, what Scott did and how Scott got on the show, if there's something out there that you think that we would find entertaining or you want to see us do an episode on, um, you can go ahead and shoot us your suggestions. The easiest way is to go on our website. It's uh, www.entertainthis.net. Scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage, and there's a little uh, questionnaire that you can fill out there where you can send us a message, uh, and we check all of those, and you can send us your suggestions there. And if we like them, we'll give you a shout-out before the episode, and we'll all take our time to uh, enjoy whatever media you had sent us, much like Blue Velvet. Uh, but there are other ways to get in contact with us, along with the website. Uh, we have a Twitter. We are entertain underscore this on Twitter. Our Instagram is entertain this podcast. That's our username. You can find us on Facebook. We are podcasts entertain this because somebody still entertain this podcast on Facebook, which, you know, happens. Uh, or you can reach out to us on our YouTube channel, entertain this. Any of those ways are great ways to get in contact with us. As always, we ask you to entertain us so we can entertain you and you can entertain this. We'll see you guys next Friday. See ya. Bye. 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 <laughs> this episode of Entertain This was written by Scott Curtis, with additional commentary from Nick Mustakangas, Michael Savoya, and Alex Steele. Our showrunner is Chloe Price. Our theme music is Rush Rubble by Aaron Spencer, with interstitial music by DJW. Tune in every Friday for new episodes, and thanks for listening.